All right, mates, welcome back. Happy Monday morning. Hope everybody had a great weekend. I want to do a really quick update here um, on some observations, and um, we are going to be back out tomorrow um, checking out um, some of the conditions. And one of the things that we're going to be looking for is the impacts of the latest um, weather patterns on the crayfish populations, okay? And so what you normally what you normally see a lot of times this time of year, um, in the last few years, uh, especially 2018, 2018 was horrible. Um, high water levels, Upper Potomac, Susquehanna, and everything feeding. So that's your Monocacy. You've got the same things up further up above, um, you know, deeper in the, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, Allegheny, um, as well, those kinds of things that, that stuff's coming down. Okay. Um, and so we had here outside where I am a crest at about 18 feet, a little over 18 feet. It's kind of the crest of this last situation. Not nearly as bad, of course, as flooding, um, in the sense that, the river stays impacted for a longer period of time. It's still technically flooding because of the stages. Um, and so you have to think about that. But we're seeing the rivers come back down, especially the upper Potomac come back down below six feet and five feet and starting to get back. But what what's the impact been? Okay, so what happens is now you're seeing, and I got some reports over the weekend, um, you're going to start to see the crayfish now. Okay, a lot more. And the reason, immature crayfish. And the reason is, is all of that um, water flow, and current flow, has basically removed a lot of the composition on the bottom, loose composition, or even it was mud, compacted composition that your crayfish have to come up through. Totally disrupted that. So basically, it's like waking up the crayfish. Okay. But then you also have to factor in if that happens, what happens to the crayfish as well? Do they get washed? Do they get caught? Do they get, they're immature? Um, do they not have time to develop? Will it impact come summertime, their development process? All of that in terms of being a forage species for your river. When we saw that after 218, when, especially the Susquehanna, where I mean, you, you you were before that you could walk on the you basically could wade out in the river and everywhere you stepped you you you'd come across a dozen or more crayfish. Well, after two eighteen, that didn't exist. Now the other thing with Susquehanna and and actually a lot of other river systems, potentially even the Potomac now, is you had about five years ago, maybe seven years ago, you started to have you started to see more of the rusty crayfish which are in fact invasive, okay, um, and they have a direct impact on the other, there's probably about 19 species of crayfish, believe it or not, um, in the Mid-Atlantic region, okay, if you just, even if you just look at Maryland, PA, Ohio, um, um, and, that, and going east, northeast from there, you're looking at about 19 different species of crayfish. Now, m a lot of those crayfish species populations that most people are unaware of and wouldn't be able to identify have been basically decimated by the rusty crayfish, especially on the Susquehanna. So when you have all of those differing populations now being concentrated into one and the rusty actually comes from the Ohio basin, you know, and then now you've also got people now concerned about rusty crayfish going as far as Wyoming. Okay. Because they've kind of started in the middle of the country and then kind of gone east and west over, you know, the course of years, okay? Because they're invasive. And until, you know, and that, that a lot of that can attribute to the fact that if you remember um, years ago, phenomenal smallie seasons, right? Susquehanna, Upper Potomac, especially, and then some other, other rivers, obviously, that um, flow into those. Um what was that from? That was from a excessive abundant population of forage that year, okay? And the subsequent year before that fattened a lot of those fish up, okay? But what happens when the crayfish isn't abundant anymore, okay? 
And so that's what the concern is, you know, in the fisheries. And then if you as an angler, you want to be aware of that because it works to your advantage to be aware of fish don't have access to as much of the forage species they're used to having access to. So what's their change in behavior? Okay. One, your crayfish bait, okay, becomes a target of opportunity. Okay. Because there's not as many available in the ecosystem, potentially. See, we won't know until we get out there, okay? But if that's the case, then there's no reason to go away from the crayfish bait or the crankbait, okay? When you normally might, okay? You might want to go finesse, soft plastics, whatever, right? Um, you know, certainly in an Ed rig, all that kind of stuff. But... When it's abundant and the fish know that their supply is abundant because of how they're interacting with their habitat, your bites will taper off. They won't increase, okay? Because the behavior of the fish changes. They're full. They're lethargic. You know, it's okay. They'll knock it away. But when they can, especially right now, after a, you know, a major current flow event, okay, with right now everything's settled out. They're going to be looking for food, okay? Sustainable food sources for them to get realigned. And the other thing that happens in these um, uh, river events like this is it also resettles structure. You've got debris coming down from, from up north, right? Coming down the river, getting jammed up, getting... Well, that's going to sit until it gets unjammed. And it may never get unjammed, okay? Okay. So I have a few, I'm going to go out there tomorrow and I'm probably going to find four or five areas that now have down trees that came from up river, okay, and have washed down and are now going to settle in. And over the next few weeks, fish will begin to move towards and align with that structure because as long, if it stays, right? What happened to the rocks? Rocks got moved. Boulders got moved. Okay, the bottoms got all dirtied up, muddied up. The composition of the bottom could be soft. It may not be hard anymore. Depends on the rate of the current flow that's pushing down river, right? That's taking everything with it, okay? And it's, it's basically, you know, we know, or at least we suspect, most of the nests, most of the beds, most of all that have been directly impacted, okay? So what stage are the smallies going to be in on the upper Potomac and the Susquehanna? Remember, not all smallmouth bass spawn at the same time. Not all smallmouth bass only spawn once, okay? So, if we start to give them a little bit more credit than a lot of people want to give them credit for, okay? A smallie could have laid eggs two weeks ago when the water temperature was 60 degrees, okay? Optimum right. But not all of her eggs were ready mature for her to lay, right? So she's still carrying those with her. And then this, this event happens. She's not going to lay those eggs until she's ready to lay those eggs, okay? And so with the water levels being what they are, the temperature level change... The everything, the pressure changing because the, hot, the more water level that you get, the pressure changes for them. Everything gets thrown haywire for them. They may again lay another round of eggs if they have them. It's happened before, okay? Um, and so that's what we want. That's what it's going to be interesting to see here in the coming weeks, okay? As the water levels get back down to below four feet, four, four and a quarter or lower. Um, but somewhere between three and a half and four and a quarter um, in a lot of areas. What will their behavior be? Or have they been scattered already? They're, they're, they've been scattered elsewhere. So that's a couple things to think about. Um, and we're going to look at and we're going to go looking for them and kind of figure out where they are and what's happening with the mud bugs, the crayfish, what's kind of happening with the shiners, what's kind of happening with um, the panfish, bluegill. Has this delayed their spawn? Um you know, we're not really concerned too much with uh, with the minnows in the shad at this point. Um, they're pretty resilient, um, but we're going to take a look at those and then um, do a little rundown, do a little report on the water report, hopefully, 
we come across them, I'll put up a video um, pulling them out. But we expect, you know, the rusty crayfish are pretty resilient. They get pretty big pretty quickly. Um, you can identify the rusty crayfish um, with um, their brown, gray, um, and they've got that two reds on both sides, kind of like middle of their back area on their sides. It's almost like uh, two daps of, of, of light red um, when they reach that level of, of probably about two inches to, to three inches, I think. About two inches. Um, they'll start to get that coloration. Um, but again, small is you're going to be looking for forage. It's, it's, they're, they should be looking for crayfish at this point. It's just a matter of what the river conditions of where you are impacted by all this rain, impacting by some flood stages in some places, what it's done to the composition of the bottom of the river. Has it stirred them up? Has it released the crayfish? Has it impacted them negative, negatively in the sense that they weren't ready to break through and then got disrupted? All, 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 of, all of that stuff. So it'll be interesting to um, investigate that. All right, mates.